Welcome to Modern Dogma, a Christian considering today's ideas. I'm your host, Elias. The Bible answers the question of our identity, who we are, in three ways. First, we are all part of certain groups. These groups are the families we belong to, our ethnicity, our nationality, and the languages we speak. Second, we are also unique individuals made in God's image that nonetheless fell into sin. And third, and most importantly, we have a spiritual identity. We are either adopted into God's family or we actively despise him. There is no middle position. It doesn't matter how flowery and sympathetic you are to Jesus. If he is not your master and king, if he does not tell you what to do and how to live, you hate him. Now what? What do we do with this information? How do we apply it, in other words? I want to share five exhortations I came up with based on these truths about our group, individual, and spiritual identities. First, majority and minority status is complex and non-racial. So let me just quickly touch on the latter. Once again, race is a myth. There is no legitimate identity that is derived simply by how you look. Nothing about the appearance of your face and skin color tells me anything about who you are on the inside. If you think you can just look at someone's skin color and you think you can make some educated guess about how they will behave or what they will prefer or how they will think or how they will vote, you have bought into the lie of racialism. You are violating God's command to not judge by someone's appearance in James 2, 1 Samuel 16, and John 7, 24. So that is what I mean when I say that whether or not you are considered part of the majority or minority is not based on the deception known as race, because race is not a real concept in the first place. Now, let's touch on the former part of the statement. What do I mean by saying majority and minority status is complex? I don't mean complex as in it's a hard or difficult subject to discuss. I mean that majority and minority status is not a flat static thing. It's a mixture, in other words. It's complex, not one-dimensional. So more often than you think, many of us are part of the majority in some ways, but then also part of a minority in some other ways. But more than that, your majority-minority status can change depending on the context of where you are. So once again, in our racialist world, when we think minority, what do you immediately envision? It's always some person of color, right? That's the trendy term to use now. It's someone with brown skin, or someone pale with almond-shaped eyes, or someone with curly hair. It's someone that is descriptively black or Asian or Middle Eastern or whatever. Now, these people are probably ethnic minorities in America. So someone that is descriptively called Asian is almost undoubtedly an ethnic minority because if you go back into his family history, he probably came from China or Vietnam or whatever, and that will make him a minority in a country where most people ethnically hail from Europe. But again, note that what makes this Asian person a minority is not actually his race or appearance. It's his ethnic origin. It's where his family line traces back to. And because he is an ethnic minority, he will have a distinct appearance. You have to get that order correct. Your bloodline produces a distinct appearance. Your family, people, group's culture is what shapes you. Your distinct Asian appearance is just the aftermath of the actually important diversity characteristic of your ethnicity that you carry. But even if we get rid of racialism and judging by appearances, minority and majority status is not just based on ethnicity. What Christians so often neglect to consider is there are very important diversity considerations when it comes to nationality and language. So in the context of America, if you are an American citizen and you speak English, you are part of a very, very important majority group. It cannot be overstated how much similarity you share with so many people in this country just by speaking English fluently and growing up as an American citizen. 
I mean, I see this personally in my life as a child of first-generation immigrants. Because I speak the American flavor of English fluently, I know all the idioms, all the phraseologies, I fit in seamlessly with the culture. And then when I compare my experience with my parents, who still have an accent, who didn't grow up eating at McDonald's and watching all the American TV shows, it's a night and day difference. They truly are, and remain to this day, minorities in terms of their language group, to a certain extent. But we neglect to think about language enough in a majority-minority sense. We think the descriptively white and descriptively black brothers at church are so different because of their contrasting skin color. But if they're both American English speakers, they have so much in common. So much of our shared culture is informed by the language. For those bilingual people out there, you know what I mean. There are certain phrases or words or ideas that just can't translate over into English. There are certain concepts that are unique to certain languages. These are important factors that shape a shared culture, a shared group identity. And I think a friend of mine at my local church is a great example of us Christians not thinking deeply enough about how important a diversity factor different languages are. So out of respect for his privacy, I'm going to change some details about my friend and we'll just call him Fred. But my buddy Fred, I remember him confiding in me recently that he's been in this country for years, but he still doesn't feel like he ever fit in. Now, the thing is, Fred is white. It's not his identity, but his stereotypical appearance is a white man. But Fred comes from a foreign nation, actually. He's not American. And you can actually pick it up if you're listening for it. He doesn't quite speak English in the same kind of sense as Americans. He has a distinct flavor in English in the way he says certain things. And this is speculative, but I wonder, did we Christians forget to consider and minister to Fred's very real minority status as a non-American, non-American English speaker? What are Fred's distinctives as a minority? What makes him comfortable and uncomfortable based on his cultural background? What are his desires? What does he struggle with that is distinct for his people group? I wonder if people like Fred are just completely ignored and just lumped together with the majority white people just because of the color of his skin. He's a minority actually in a very important sense, but if you're only judging by appearances, you won't be able to tell. But not only that, Note that your minority and majority status can change. My friend Fred can learn the American brand of English. He might be very talented at languages and become very fluent and intuitively understand American English one day. And then gradually, he would no longer be a minority language-wise. Or Fred can move back to his country of origin and he'd be part of the majority again in every sense. You can drill down into individual cities in America. There can be a city with a huge population of people that ethnically come from Latin American countries. Suddenly, the pale-skinned white man whose family comes from Northern Europe, he's now the minority in the ethnic sense. That church with a Latin American majority now needs to be considerate to the white guy to make sure he doesn't feel left out. And another thing to consider is that when you have a biblically informed understanding of the four categories of group identity, you recognize that there is way more diversity than you think. This monolithic group you are calling African American is really composed of many different diverse group identities. You have people from Senegal, people from Nigeria, people that grew up in New York, people that grew up in Cuba. You have American black people, you have French black people, you have Spanish speaking black people. Do you see how silly it is to just lump everyone in? Ah, you're all just black. You're all just African Americans. You guys are all the same. You're completely missing all these little important cultural differences, these important group diversities, because all you're looking at is appearance. And the same exact thing goes for what we call white people. There is no monolithic group identity called white people. There is the Johnson family and the O'Reilly family, and they are very different from each other with different family values. There are Northern Europeans. There are Southern Europeans. Yes, 
They are different. Just look at all the controversy in the United Nations. There are some very real cultural distinctions between Europeans. And then nationality-wise, among white people, there are American citizens, Canadian citizens, South African citizens. There are English-speaking white people, German-speaking white people. There is no such thing as a flattened, simplified, static white person. There is no white culture. Whiteness is a complete myth. Majority and minority statuses are complex. It is foolish for anyone to adopt a monolithic label that I'm a minority, or in the Marxist social justice language, I'm the marginalized, I'm the oppressed. You're on the margins in which sense? In which sense are you a minority? You can't just make a flat statement like that because you may be a minority in one sense, but chances are you are going to be part of the majority in another sense. And maybe you are a minority in all four group categories. But the point is that majority-minority status is a complex mixture, and it's not an easy call to make just based on looking at someone's face. You have to actually get to know the person and dig into their background to figure out whether they fit in with most people or if there's something distinguishing about them that you need to be especially considerate about. Really, when we recognize that majority-minority status is complex, you walk around not making assumptions of other people. You don't make that immature, underdeveloped, charged, oh, your eyes are blue and your skin is pale, you're part of the majority, you don't understand, you are so privileged in the church, you don't get how it feels to be an outsider. Maybe, but maybe not. You can't make that call so quickly. Or, oh, your skin is brown and your eyes are brown, you are so underprivileged, you had a life full of hardship. Again, maybe he did, maybe not. If all I have to go on is a photograph, I have no clue. Maybe his church is full of people just like him. He might be firmly in the majority. What is his context? What is his family background? What language does he speak? I can't get any of that from just a picture of the guy. And by the way, you'll notice that all these discussions I'm having is firmly in the context of the Christian community. Once again, as I stated in episode one, I am talking to believers. I am talking to believers in the only context that really matters, the only reality that has any eternal worth, and that is the context of the community of believers in the church. The church is not a building. Church does not just happen on Sunday. The church is all Christians everywhere relating to one another. These exhortations don't really apply to the outside world. Look, if you are an ethnic minority and you are treated unfairly by a world full of people that hate God, I'm right there with you, okay? I get it. I lived it. But I am under no illusion I can solve it. None of these exhortations and information I'm giving you is for them. It'll just fall on deaf ears. They don't believe in the Bible. They need to be fundamentally changed as people. And you know what? It is so liberating to recognize that. It is so freeing to recognize that I don't have to carry the burdens of how I am persecuted out there in the world because true reality, my true life, is in the context of fellow Christians. That is where my universe resides. When I have to go to my job, when I need to go grocery shopping, that's just a foreign mission field. I'm an alien there. I'm a visitor. But don't bring in the baggage of all the racism and prejudice and injustice that are thrown at you by the world into the church. That's my point. Inside here, among the family, we are fundamentally made different by God's grace and love. Yes, people call you black, Hispanic, a brown guy. People stick that false, crude, stereotypical identity on you and then treat you differently because of it. But don't bring in that baggage when you are relating to Christians. We are literally a different nation, a different race, as 1 Peter chapter 2, 9 states. And that brings us to exhortation number two. And that is, don't slander God's wife. You see, the Bible states in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 31 to 32, quote, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. 
This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church, end quote. You see, this means that the point of marriage between two humans isn't the marriage in itself. It's not about finding your life partner and being happy with a companion. That's all fine and good. It's an enormous benefit. But marriage itself serves a greater purpose. Everything is God-centered. Nothing is about humanity. Everything is by Christ and for Christ, as Colossians 1.16 says. Marriage is meant to picture the true marriage the prototypical marriage that earthly marriages between humans are just derivative of. And that is Jesus's marriage to the corporate body of believers, the church. You know what this means? For those of you that are married, imagine someone coming up to your wife and spitting in her face. Or the opposite for the ladies. Imagine someone abusing your husband right in front of you. Or if you're not married, picture your girlfriend or boyfriend and someone just walks up and starts throwing F-bombs at them. You see, it's bad enough when we slander or speak poorly of other individual Christians. That's sinful enough. But when you elevate that slander and start speaking poorly of the church as a collective body, when you start slinging around accusations that the church has issues with systemic injustice or systemic racism, you have just spit into Jesus's wife's face, and that should cause you to feel utmost terror. You think you'd get angry if someone abused your wife? You haven't seen the anger of God. You see, the Bible doesn't say individual Christians will always be perfect in this life. Just the opposite, actually. It says, God has to continue the work of conforming us to the image of Christ until the day we die in Philippians chapter 1, 6. We are not already perfect, Philippians 3, 12. Great men of faith like Peter will backslide, will bite and stab each other as individual believers. That's why God has to keep reminding us so many times throughout the New Testament, guys, stop fighting, love one another, prefer one another. But when it comes to the church as a collective group, the tone totally changes. Jesus guarantees that when it comes to the church as a corporate body, we will be known in the world for the supernatural love we demonstrate to one another. That's John chapter 13, verse 35. No one loves each other like Christians love each other. Jesus promises it. And it's true. I've lived it. You have too. Nobody loves you like your brothers and sisters, not even family. Ephesians 2, 20 to 22 says the church is God's special, holy dwelling place. He lives among us and he keeps his place immaculate. It's a holy place. That word holy literally means called out of. The church is different, in other words. It is a place of righteousness and purity. When you bring a charge like systemic racism into the context of the church, You have just said to God, you are a liar, or you are incompetent to keep your wife pure and holy. You have just declared to the Almighty, John 13, 35 and Ephesians 2, 20 to 22 are wrong. You see, it's an obvious fact that the world system is corrupt. And yes, that includes racism. The problem, of course, is the world always points to the wrong things as systemic racism, but that's another conversation. Speaking to the social justice theologian, yes, I agree. Systemic racism exists in the world. You aren't defining it correctly, but obviously I expect it to exist. But it does not exist in the church because God said so. The wife of Christ is a pure and spotless bride that God will not allow the gates of hell to prevail over. Are there individual churches that are full of individual Christians that are very disobedient, don't preach the word of God, don't walk the talk? Sure. And at that point, your responsibility is to recognize that's probably not a church at all and you need to go find a real one. But the church as a whole, the Lord Jesus promises he will keep his wife pure. So my exhortation is do not bring the baggage of the injustices that you nevertheless legitimately faced in the world and cause that to spill over into the church life. Don't let that hatred and anger fester in your heart and spill over against the church. Yes, 
You are treated unfairly as someone that is called an African American person out there in the world at your job. Do not assume the same kind of unconscious biases and unjust treatment among brethren. These social justice theologians like Jamar Tisby, who professes to be a Christian and yet writes a book titled The Color of Compromise, The Truth About the American Church's Complicity in Racism. The title itself is a slanderous accusation that the corporate church is corporately racist. And then he continues in the book, quote, Christians plural, deliberately chose complicity with racism in the past, end quote. Plural, not individual Christians, not specific names, the church. Social justice theologians like Tisby ought to be in fear and trembling for the slanderous abuse they heap upon Jesus' wife. These social justice advocates spit in the bride's face while the groom is standing right next to her. And they mistake the groom's long suffering and patience with approval. Do you think you're getting away with the evil you speak against the church just because God isn't destroying you right now? Do you think Jesus is just passively watching with disinterest or perhaps even smiling and applauding you for how enlightened and woke you are about the church's imperfections? Consider the Apostle Peter's warning. A day is like a thousand years to the Lord and a thousand years is like a day. You are provoking a very patient and merciful lion that is, nonetheless, still a lion. If you are truly one of God's children, you will be disciplined and made to return to the straight and narrow path. And that discipline can oftentimes be very, very painful, sometimes even to the point of earthly death. 1 Corinthians chapter 11.30 says, Sometimes God will just kill you with an ignominious death and take you to heaven if you persist in unrepentant disobedience. And more often than not, if you are not a true believer saying these sorts of things, the lack of apparent immediate response by Christ to your abuse of his wife is nothing more than God patiently noting in his book of deeds every blasphemous insult, every slanderous tweet, every angry outburst. He is keeping an exacting record of your careless defamations against the church. And one day you will see the complete body of evidence that will assure you that your condemnation is just. Now, that all being said, though we ought to be very, very careful of how we talk about the church as a whole, can individual Christians, can a particular Christian believer sometimes be guilty of the sin of racism? Because of the persistent influence of our flesh, as Romans 7 calls it, I believe genuine Christians are in danger of occasionally committing any kind of sin. So, of course, sadly, even acts of racism. However, to my ethnic minority brothers and sisters in particular, I encourage you to reflect a little more deeply. Was that rude thing that your brother said to you at church the other day truly racist? Or was it just rude? Is it more accurate to just say your friend said something careless or inconsiderate? Because we are commanded to give fellow Christians the benefit of the doubt. Please note that in our culture today, racism is an act our society considers so immoral that people lose their jobs, people's businesses are boycotted. In some countries, people even go to jail because of what they define loosely as hate speech. Are you sure you want to fling around a word that is so loaded with moral weight and confer it to your brother in the Lord? Now, it doesn't mean he wasn't being racist. Maybe he was. If your appearance is a black guy and your Christian friend set up a burning cross on your front lawn and hung a noose on your door, yeah, probably an act of racism. That's probably the word I would use when I confront him and start the process of loving church discipline. But look, let's be a little more introspective. How many dumb things do we say all the time by accident? So ethnic minorities, you have to understand, in our American culture today, for our Christian friends that society labels as white people, being called a racist is like the ultimate kryptonite. That is the social death sentence to a descriptively white person. You can never become truly unracist in our cancel culture world, especially if you are white. 
There is a psychological baggage with not being labeled racist that plays into this unbiblical temptation called white guilt that our white brothers and sisters oftentimes struggle with. So the ethnic minority Christians, I just encourage you out of consideration and love and patience, are you sure you want to jump to the R word to describe that uncomfortable conversation you had with your Christian brother or sister? Again, Maybe it was truly racism. Maybe that is the best word to describe what happened. No Christian is so perfect that they are above that possibility, sadly. But anecdotally, in my entire life of walking with the Lord, I've never personally experienced a situation among Christian brothers that I would call racist rather than inconsiderate or rude. I've experienced genuine racism in the world, sure, but in the church, never. And that is what we ought to expect from our individual Christian brothers because the corporate collective body of believers is kept holy and undefiled by her bridegroom, the Lord Jesus Christ. So we got through two out of five exhortations this episode. Number one, again, majority and minority status is complex. And number two, don't slander God's wife. We'll begin with our third exhortation next episode. Thanks for joining me today on Modern Dogma. Men err, God is sovereign.